Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 27, Bellhop Board Gaming Birthday Bash. Back in Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mochi. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Now, most of the feedback I got this past week was about the four to six player after dinner game suggestions, including some great new suggestions from fans and, and people supporting our choices as well. Just going to fire those off fairly quick. We have at NavSync on Twitter suggested New York Slice as a good four to six player after dinner game. I do like the tie in of the food theme to the food event. At random underscore scrub on Twitter. I love Between Two Cities, or the sequel mashup Between Two Castles, for the lighter end of that spectrum. I highly recommend giving them a try if you haven't yet. Uh, Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig is on my wish list. I do dig the original game, I just haven't tried the mashup of the two. Phil Hatfield on Me We noted, I heartily agree with Shadows Over Camelot and Thunder Alley. Both are excellent games and really fit the bill for good four to six player games. Mark Whitley notes, Concept is a great game. I've described it as a thinking man's party game. We also got some feedback from Emmett O'Brien, who asked the original question. Added a bunch of these to my wish list. Some of these I've heard about, but I didn't know if they were any good. There's some surprising picks. I didn't know much about Scoville, and I think I'd heard of Mutant Meeples, but it wasn't a game I'd paid attention to. I had not heard of Concept or Euphoria, so those are completely new to me. Awesome feedback, Emmett. I am glad we are able to open your eyes to something new. And it also reinforces my fact that concept is still a hidden gem and people haven't heard of it yet. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. There's a ton of gaming going on this week. It was kind of crazy. Uh, there were a couple birthday parties, including my own, as well as our regular Gloomhaven game. Now, we're going to save the birthday gaming bash for the main topic because Sean was there, I was there, we played a ton of games. That's going to be our main recap later. So when talking about Tabletop Gaming Weekly, I just want to talk about the games we played this past week that weren't part of the party. Now, how about you? Were you at the, you were that ah, besides the party? Did you get any gaming in besides that? I did. My my theme of the week was card games. Uh, we got in uh, some DC uh, deck collection uh, games, and I played a whole lot of Ascension on the on Steam. Nice, very nice. So Wednesday night, a friend of mine, Tuzi, had a birthday party at the local game store at the CG Realm. Now, this wasn't a big event and consisted of mostly people she knew from uh, from school. And most of them were total non-gamers. Like, you know, they had Monopoly experience, if that, or played games with their friends. Uh, the event opened with Tuz opening some gifts, one of which was Dragon Ball Z Yahtzee. While they set that up, I... Uh, politely declined playing Yahtzee and grabbed some dinner from the Windsor Sandwich Shop and let them play while I ate my French dip. Yes, I actually did not get Coney Dogs. I'm kind of sold on the French dip right now. I think I may be slightly Coney Dog do. As far as Dragon Ball Z, they seem to have fun with it. Um, as far as I could tell, there wasn't anything special about it, except it came in a big plastic Dragon Ball, and the dice had pictures of the characters, but I think it was still... Same old sets, runs, follows, Yahtzee that always existed before. Yeah, it's another one of those trends right now. Perfectly good games on their own, jacked up in price because of a theming. Uh, now, again, I can't really talk because I have Doctor Who Yahtzee, <laughs> which has the villain images on the dice and a TARDIS to roll them in. Uh, but it still frustrates me even if I fall for the play. 
Yeah, it sounds like the same thing then. It's probably the exact same game, just different pitchers on the dice. Like partway through, I'm, I'm watching them play. I'm like, how do you know? Like, is five Goku's the Yahtzee? And they're like, oh, the numbers are on there too. And I'm like, oh, well, oh, so there's no... Like, the Doctor Who one, the numbers actually aren't there and it's really oh. annoying. <laughs> yeah, like how would you know you have a street? That's where I was confused. Well, you've got it's one of each pitcher. Oh, you know, I guess. And you just assume they're in order? Yeah, it's it's kind of frustrating, but... All right. But the TARDIS is, in my opinion, at least way cooler than this big plastic well, Dragon Ball. You would you would actually think so, but we actually stopped using it because dice inside a cheap plastic TARDIS is one of the loudest rolling yes. ever. I could see that. I'll admit I keep getting tempted by the Firefly one because the dice cup is a nice model Serenity. Ooh, nice. And, and it looks really nice. And I'm like, huh, it's Yahtzee. So anyway. Moving on to the next game. So after that, they wanted something everyone would could play. I kind of were, I think that was a Freudian slip there. Uh, and Two's pulled out a copy of Monty Python Flux. Now, I am not a huge Flux fan, but it's okay. So I agreed to play. Now, for anyone who doesn't know Flux, the rules are really simple. I will teach you the entire game right now in six words. Draw a card, play a card. That's it. That's the entire rules in the box. When you buy Flux and you open it, that's all it tells you. That's all you need to know to start playing, and that's it. You go. So now, after playing any version of Flux, you learn pretty quickly it's all about getting the right goal card into play and having the right keeper cards in your play area that match that goal at the same time while trying to make sure no one else does that before you. Every game of Flux plays exactly the same. So yes, the six word rules are kind of cute, but there is a little more to it. As soon as you see your first goal card, it explains all that. Now, besides the goals and keepers, there are a ton of other cards that mess with the rules, stuff that makes you drop five cards or play all your cards. Now, the whole thing with Flux is the theming again. So we're looking at a licensed version of the game. So we've got Monty Python Flux. So there are lots of extra cards tied to this theme. So draw an extra card if you can sing a Monty Python song. Draw an extra two if it's one no one's used yet. Play extra cards if you talk in a silly accent. Play two extra cards if you talk in a silly accent until it comes back around to your turn again. And that kind of thing. That gets your whole Monty Python thing in there. Now, there's another type of card that wasn't in the original Flux that started getting added to the newer versions, and those are called Creepers. Obviously, I'm guessing based on Minecraft. I don't know. or if, if Maybe they're not tied together. But what those have is if you have a Creeper, you have to play it. You can't win when you have them. The Monty Python one seemed to have a lot more of these than any other set I played, as well as cards that moved them. So if you had Excalibur, it let you chase away a creeper from your play area to someone else's. I got to say, Flux is a dumb, silly game. Uh, it went over well with this group of gamers and non-gamers. Like, it, it works. Sometimes I find Flux is too short. I've actually played a game where I didn't even get to take a turn and I lost. And other times I've seen it go for over an hour. This game didn't do that, so it was actually fun. As long as Flux gets played, played quick, and you're done in 15 minutes or so, it's a great game, but there's just too much variety for it to sometimes spread to, uh, too quick or too long. I have to say, the, the game format and uh, the yeah. basic rules really do seem to fit a Monty Python. Uh, you start off expecting one thing, and then it goes somewhere else and gets downright silly. No, it's I like agree. every it's Monty Python movie out there. It does. It, it fits really well. I, I, Flux, it's, it's okay series. It's there's, there's enough versions out there. Everyone may find one they like. It's not something I tend to chase after, but I was happy to play it, and we all had a good time. So after Flux, I got to check out, break out one of the games I brought. I uh, actually grabbed something off the pile of shame for this, and that is the dexterity game Bandu. Because I find dexterity games are great icebreakers for people you don't know, and also really good for non-gamers. And plus, it was the easiest game I brought because I didn't know who was going to be at this event. So I brought a bunch of stuff. And like I said, these were non-gamers. Like I think Azul would have been over their heads for a couple of the, the people there. So something really simple where you're stacking bricks seems a little easier. Well, and like we talk about, you know, whenever you're doing any sort of event, even if it's just a birthday party, uh, if you have the ability to bring options, it's always wise to hedge your bets. You don't want to pull out Terraforming Mars as the only game you've got when people are expecting exploding kittens. No, oh, true enough. This is this is one of those cases where I definitely was not going to push the Terraforming Mars. Though I will admit I did bring it just in case there happened to be a bunch of gamers there. Oh, of course. So Bandu. Bandu is a wooden piece stacking game that uses a pretty cool auction mechanic for determining who has to place what. At least for the basic game, because the, the box comes with four ways to play. 
So each turn, you got all these wooden pieces in front of you. You're going to pick a piece. And, like, these are funky pieces. They're, they're, there's standard blocks and poles and a couple tubes, but there's balls and tree-shaped things and egg cups. And uh, I swear one's a golf tee. Like, they're uniquely shaped pieces. So you pick one of these, and you have two choices. You can either auction it to keep, so whoever bids the highest gets to keep that piece and play, place it. Or you can auction it to not take it or by, de by denial, where you pass it to the next person and say, huh, do something with this. And they're like, oh, no, I'm bidding one. I don't want to take that. And then the next person has to bid two. Next person has to bid three and so on. I really dig this mechanic. Uh, I enjoy passing terrible, hard-to-place pieces to my neighbors. I found a lot of joy in that. And then whoever ha gets the piece after the auction has to add it to their structure. Really simple. If any piece hits the table other than your base, that player is out and it's last person standing. So what you're saying is you've got a sadistic streak we haven't really delved into before. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. I don't like lying to my friends and social deduction, but totally screwing them over. I'm all good with that. There we go. Uh, Pandu went well. It went really good. Uh, I was amused because one of the players who, again, not much gaming experience was like, oh, I like it. It's reverse Jenga. Instead of taking down the tower, you're building up, and she seemed to really enjoy it. Uh, we had a good enough time. We actually played a second round almost right away. Uh, this time we used one of the other sets. So the difference here was every piece you added had to go make your player, your, your tower, taller. And then it had a neat rule where if you tried to um, hand a bad piece to your neighbor, if they couldn't place it, they'd be like, no, wait, I can't do this. You show me where you would put it. And if you couldn't do it, you were out of the game. So it was kind of neat because it added, so you couldn't totally mess up your opponent. You couldn't hand them an unplayable piece because then they would just hand it back to you and go, okay, smart guy, come on, you put it on here then. So it, it added a nice balance for not messing with the other players too badly. I like that. Uh, now, I'm, I'm just noticing there seem to be some different versions that have very different piece sets. Um, I see at least three different sets of pieces available Uh Noted, uh, people are complaining on, on Board Game Geek that there should actually be different entries because the the sets of pieces are so really? different. See that? I don't know. I, I got this for my birthday. It was my first time playing my personal copy. Now, years ago, um, one of our fans, local gamer, Will Chamberlain in the chat room, if he happens to show up, had the game, but it was under a different brand. It was called Bossack or Bassack or Bowsack, something like that. Uh, they ended up changing the name because people made fun of it and said something you would have to ding out when they said the name of the game. I'm not going to say that name. But I just assumed the pieces were the same. It's highly possible that there were different pieces in that. I'm not sure. Because I all I know is my copy. And so the one I played, I think I tried Jamie's game years ago. It, I don't know. It had similar pieces. They were white and red. Yeah, apparently as early as uh, 1987, uh, <laughs> this game has been coming out, and there are a 87. lot. 87. Wow. There are a lot of different sets of this. Um, like I can, I, I'm seeing looks like five different sets in one thread huh. on, uh, and it, and yeah, Bow, Bowsack. B a u Bowsack. B a u s a c k is I guess the original. The original, yeah, uh, they renamed it to to Bandu. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's good to know. I didn't know it was that old. That's that's pretty cool. Because so I got to say, for a game from the '80s, it stands up, yeah. and not just because it's a stacking game. <laughs> <laughs> God, done. Cut. No. <laughs> so before I get to our weekly Gloomhaven game, what's something else you played? Tell us about one of those card games. All right. Well, again, it was all about card games and deck builders specifically. Uh, but no Hogwarts this week. Uh, huh? It just didn't get to our table. Uh, instead. You and I had talked a while back about other deck builders uh, with how well Hogwarts had gone over with my family. Uh, and so while we discussed Marvel, there were just a few sort of issues and I, I wasn't quite sure about it. And the overall of, uh, tone of the Cryptozoic DC game really seemed to fit more where my son was at. So I picked it up and it turns out you were right. I was right. We were right. Uh, right. At first, he wasn't sure when he found out it was competitive, but yeah. it's not completely competitive because you are working together to defeat the bad guys. Just one of you is going to beat more bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was okay with that, understanding that we were still both playing. If I had been playing a bad guy and he was playing a good guy, it might not have gone over well. But because we were both playing heroes, beating up on the bad guys, he was right into it. Um, and he loved the cards, the art, and the recognition of some of his favorite comic book characters uh, really gave, uh, made the game enjoyable. 
That's awesome. Actually, it sounds like that's an even better reason not to have picked the Marvel one, because the Marvel one's even weirder, because the Marvel one seems like it's 100% co-op, but then you score at the end. Or at least in this one, you can see that, well, Batman beat up this villain and Wonder Woman beat up that villain. Right. And the other one's not like that. It's like we all work together, but someone wins. Right. So I think that would have went over a little worse. Though you did mention something that I've never seen that I think has to exist. Why is there not a you play the villain, I play the hero, and we beat each other up game? Like, where's the superhero version of Star Realms or Ascension? There, are, there must be somewhere. I, I can't think of one where it's just like a two plus ascension doesn't really ascension you're fighting the board, but more star realms where you're at actually attacking each other. Uh, and then speaking of ascension, the rest of my time <laughs> was spent playing ascension on Steam. Uh, now again, I've said this before, I cannot imagine playing physical ascension <laughs> uh, with the sheer number of expansions available. It would be like stacking, you know, or shuffling yeah, a deck it's, it's... that's you know this tall. I, I I just can't even imagine doing it. <laughs> However, on the computer. All the cards are easily shuffled, and they can put play spaces wherever they want. Some of the expansions now are hiding them off, like, on this corner of the screen, out of sight. Okay. Uh, there's just a little set of clouds that come up, and, and you know that there are some cards over there, but you only use them especially. Um, so that's been great, and I've been loving the quick games of it, playing uh, played out as I'm working just through the day. Uh, and I'm... Doing all right, although uh, apparently there are some people out there who are just far better than me, as I had a couple of uh, horrible, little, horribly scarring experiences uh, where some people ran the table on me late in the game. But overall, uh, yeah, for me, it's all been about the deck builders. That's very cool. I haven't kept up with the uh, the Ascension. I, I don't even remember what expansion I bought less, but it definitely didn't have extra stuff on the edges. For shuffling all the cards, Big J at one point, I think it might have been during Extra Life, decided to combine all of his Ascension sets. And what he did is he put all the cards in a cardboard box and then rolled the box and shook it. And to draw, you just reached into the box and drew five cards because we couldn't think of a good way to actually shuffle. Well, yeah, I mean, even deck shufflers don't handle that many no. cards. So. Oh, no, exactly. So yeah, I, I personally, I'm, I'm like, I like my games a little more than that. The cards did not do well with getting shuffled that way, but hey, it was his game and he had fun with it. Yeah. And NG Games mentions it was the first or second Extra Life that. that yeah, happened. it was a long time ago. It, it was, it was a good event. I didn't actually play in that game, but I just remember him shaking this box and me going, "Oh my God, what are you doing to your cards?" So Friday night, Friday night, Gloomhaven. It happened. We streamed. We play every Friday night starting at 8.30 Eastern. You could watch us live at twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop. We welcome you to join in and correct our rule mistakes. So I think we're getting better. So last week, some big bad elemental demon dude tried to hire us to steal an artifact. And we're like, huh, I, I don't know about that. We kind of got a bunch of XP and we kind of want to level up. So we're like, hmm, yeah, yeah, we'll go do that. And we left and we went to Gloomhaven. And we leveled up. We hit town. We uh, found some guy who asked us to find his brother, which was cool because it added a new card to the deck. So that was something new we hadn't experienced in the game before. So one of the things that I now know about Gloomhaven is I knew there were two decks and their cards had, but like you can have encounters that add new cards to other decks that will make things happen later, which is cool. It's the same mechanic that Fallout, the board game uses, that I really like, where you do something and then at some point in the future it's going to come back whether good or bad. I'm assuming we're going to find Dude's brother eventually. Um, that was cool. We went and had a road encounter where we failed to help some dude with a broken cart, which was a little disappointing because that was one where if he had had the right character class in the group, we could have done something, but we didn't. So we're just like, sorry, dude. And then we went back to the elemental plane. Yeah, and now so I want to note, you were lying to a demon. Now, yeah. this isn't especially problematic. This is a role-playing game in some ways. Except when you forget that you were lying while you're taking your notes. <laughs> well, yeah, there was was that problem. We we did flub setup. We we almost started the wrong scenario. So heads up, if you are going to take notes on what you're going to do next week in Gloomhaven, write down the right number. I don't know if that was me saying the wrong number, cat writing down the wrong number. I don't know which it was. I, but we I can actually I can actually confirm that after highlighting the videos today. Uh, <laughs> it's all on you. She, oh, she, there checked, you go. she checked and confirmed with you twice, and you and you gave her 22. So oh, there you go. I wasn't, sure, I wasn't sure, but I happened to catch it today while I was highlighting. So. 
See, I told you we make mistakes. Yep. I think I was just lying so well that we were going to get the artifact that we wrote down that we were going to go get the artifact. So that's not what we were doing. <laughs> so now, now I know we get to see <laughs> we went the wrong spot. My bad. So after a quick reset up of the map and reset up of the tiles and me going nuts thinking I lost some um, card holders that I actually didn't because only six come in the game, uh, we jumped back through the portal and went to the Infernal Throne. The big bad demon guy wasn't too happy about this, so we had to take care of him. Scenario went well. I think we all played rather well together. We didn't seem to be getting in each other's way as much uh, as previous and though we did have some differing opinions on which way to go, our teamwork seemed to be rather solid. That said, it was a tough fight. Um, it was tough before we found the boss, and then once we did, it got even tougher. I've got to say it was a very interesting scenario that played with the rules in an interesting way. I personally like the fact the goal wasn't just kill all the things. I don't want to explain more than that for anyone who hasn't played the scenario yet. Now, this was also the first scenario where... Burke the Savas Craig Hart ended up exhausted well before the end of the fight. Um, I took one really bad hit where I took, I think, eight damage in one hit, and I should have discarded some cards. Instead, I tried to get through the next round and heal myself with only having one point left. Uh, it didn't happen. I got surrounded by demons and burnt through the rest of my deck in literally one turn. I think I got hit six times at one hit point and had to burn through six cards. But at least at that point, I felt I'd done my part. I'd done a ton of damage. I soaked a ton of damage, if nothing else. So I think my sacrifice was worth it. Uh, the rest of the party managed to bring home a win, but it was a close one. And there were rocks flying everywhere right up until the time you dropped. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I'm the DM of that game. That's what I do. I walk around, I'm like, rocks fall, you die. That's, that's what my character has become since hitting level four. <laughs> After the big battle and looting the throne room, we headed back to town and spent some of that loot. I think at this point, everyone bought something. Like, we went on a shopping spree. Um, I think I bought two potions. Like, I think I, I know uh, um, Deanna finally got some ring that lets her summon skeletons or something she's been looking for. She, we got we did a bunch of shopping. Uh, we all hit up the, I keep wanting to call it temple. It's not like a church. Uh, wherever. We got blessed. I think it might be a druid. There's some way you can get blessed. We all went and got blessed. Um, then we sat down and we were trying to figure out what to do. So we had a short discussion. We even brought out the, the map and we were like, wait, where's the main plot? So we talked about this on a previous episode. This is one of the problems I've been having with Gloomhaven is trying to remember the plot points. Like, I almost want to find a plot tree somewhere to go, yeah, 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 okay, we, we could go back this way. And then when we're doing it, I don't remember who in the group, there, we could get the video ed evidence for that, uh, can't, realized, wait a minute, why couldn't we just go get the artifact? Because we have a spot on the map, and the rules are you pick a spot on the map, and the demon really wanted it, so it must be pretty cool. So we've decided we're going to go grab that artifact difference this time is we don't have anyone we need to hand it over to when we're done well it was an exciting although lengthy romp through <laughs> the dungeon and believe it or not the sizable video that goes live on youtube tomorrow is the cut <laughs> down version i took out a bunch of non-essential stuff that happened on the stream yeah we were like i said we had some reset ups i was looking for stuff i almost knocked over all the equipment it, it, I, I was not on my game out of the game in the game i think i played well but it, out of game. I don't know. I was off my ball. So that's the end of uh, our week in review. Again, we'll be getting to the board game or the board game, the birthday games in just a bit. For those of you following the Less Shame More Game Challenge, that is one more game off my pile of shame. The pile Band of new. shame. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 930 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Anchi Games. Tonight in our chat, we have Shadzar, and Brian has dropped by. Oh, awesome. I also see uh, Smallpox Champion in one list, uh, and then a bunch of bots in another list that I'm just yeah. not going to list, because I know they're bots. Cat uh, Attack was in earlier. She's been having a real trouble getting her internet to, to stream Twitch for some reason. Like, even on her phone. Like, I don't know if she got, like, an old, I don't know, I don't even know, cell phone lg 3g whatever like something that can't handle twitch i don't know oh. i told her i told her to try putting it on just in audio mode because that's what i used to have to do for misdirected mark when i had the worst home internet but 
Is she using the app or the or just the website? I don't know. Maybe that's why I should ask. Yeah, she might. She might have better. If, if she's using one, try the other, and it might. Yeah, uh, I hadn't thought of that. Might go a little better for her. Uh, yeah, they also. Yeah. They do also live out in the middle of nowhere. So. Right. Uh, so Shadzar is wondering if Bandu is also that whistling guy from Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> huh. Yondu. Yeah. Yondu, Bandu. Not Close quite. Yeah. Close. It's, it's better than my pun. So about making, I noticed he also replied to my pun, but I'm not going to justify <laughs> that comment with my own comment. And then she games has to cheer. Yay! Scully Ring for her new purchase yes. in Moonham. <laughs> I almost bought one too just because I thought it was cool. but. Yeah. I know Kat was eyeing that too, but I don't, I don't even remember what I bought. I bought potions. Potions will let me get cards back. That's right. Because, well, I would have lived if I had another well, card. And, and Tori was just interested in selling off whatever he got, right? He got, yeah, he got, he got something, something cool, and it just wasn't that cool. I don't know. It, it's, nah, I don't want to spoil it because that, <laughs> that was technically a, a True. Yes. Yes. That, that was, that was spoiler, spoiler bait. <laughs> technically, maybe the Scully ring might be too. I don't know. We're, when we talk about Gloomhaven, we're probably going to spoil sh- stuff. Close. Good save. Good save. <laughs> we're probably going to spoil stuff. We are growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, like rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Uh, Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and everything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. So Sean and I have been working on putting out way more content with a focus on video content. Uh, we're at the point now where we should have something new coming out every day of the week. It's kind of nuts. We're really trying to make sure that we make the time uh, make the time you invest in us worthwhile, so that we have so much more than just a podcast for when you stop by, especially on YouTube. Yeah, last Thursday we released our second Gloomhaven actual play video on YouTube. Uh, this was attempt number two at scenario 10, Plane of Elemental Power. And obviously the one where I told Kat the wrong number at the end of the game. Friday we recorded the Gloomhaven play you just heard about in our Week in Review. And that will go live on YouTube Thursday, tomorrow, for those of you joining us live. And then Saturday we released a teach and play video of Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra. Sunday, the second Express check-in video was released. In this one, Mo covers episode 26 of the podcast, Digestif. And then Monday, Sean released an unboxing of that same Azul game, Stained Glass of Sintra. Then, finally yesterday, our last full podcast episode went out on both YouTube and should have hit your podcatchers at 2 a.m. So that's a lot of stuff. So here's the plan. Just for those of you who want to know what we're putting out, again, subscribe to the newsletter. You'll uh, you'll get this in your inbox so you don't miss anything. So Mondays, we're going to try to put out an unboxing. We've got a couple saved up. And if you stick around for our Pento Suite After Show, you might get a couple extra unboxings tonight. On Tuesday, our podcast goes out. That's on YouTube and on out to your podcatcher. On Wednesday, we do what we're doing right now. We do the live show. On Thursday, the Gloomhaven actual play from the Friday previous comes out. So if you did miss the live show, you can catch up before Friday when the next Gloomhaven live play gets recorded. That's when myself, Deanna, Tori, and Kat sit down and play Gloomhaven. Then Saturday, we're going to release something else. Now, this is the one that's kind of open. Uh, we've released an actual play of Stained Glass of Sintra. We've got other actual plays if we do any teaching plays or that might be the day that sean and i sit and play a game of keyforge together and put that out something like that saturday is kind of the the catch-all extra. Yeah. extra the bonus stuff and then of course sunday is the new express check-in show which is actually proving to be very popular on youtube so far uh that's where i take what we're doing right now distill that down to about 15 to 20 minutes and give you a scratch the surface of what you're listening to right now and watching right now. And if you haven't caught it yet, be aware that it's not just Mo talking. We do have uh, video and s- static content in there as well. Uh, there are images and there is a reason to actually watch it, not just listen to it, which is why it's not out on the podcast right now, just on YouTube. Yeah, that's uh, right now it's YouTube exclusive content. It's probably going to stay that way. 
So coming up, I almost want to say next month. Next month, for those of you not live, coming up in March on the 15th to 17th, Sean, Deanna, and I will all be at Breakout Con. That is in wonderful Toronto, Ontario at the Sheridan Centre right downtown. Now, this is a fantastic gaming convention that features all forms of gaming, RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, and a fantastic board game room with a huge game library. And I swear every day they announce three more guests. Like, it's insane. They I, seem like, to. It's insane. And I, I, know, know. I know that venue isn't actually big enough to have that many, uh, like, speaking areas going on. So I don't know how they're going to cram in all this content with all these guests they've got. Well, I, I have access to the schedule now that I contacted them about getting our passes. And they're not just doing panels on the one day. So panels start right on Friday and they go all okay. weekend. And there's a panel every hour. Every guest is doing at least one panel. Oh, wow. I have a feeling every guest might only be doing one panel <laughs> unless they're grouped together because they have so many. It's, it's crazy. It's like a who's who of independent game design. Like if, if, if there's an indie RPG that you've seen, the re- designer's probably going to be there. There are board game people as well. Like they've even got Mandy from uh, the Dice Tower is going to be there. It's, it's insane. Yeah, and I, I have a feeling I may end up even just sort of camping out in there while I, when I am there, because uh, I know I'm going to have to, th- I think I'm going to miss part of one day, but I mean, I may end up just camping in there and, and uh, taking that in for a, uh, to see yeah. something different. Well, that's what I did the whole day Sunday last year, and I had a great time. That was that was actually one of the better experiences, like meeting the Mr. Act and Mark people and everything was awesome. But, but like spending Sunday just sitting in on panels was fascinating. It was like listening to podcasts, but seeing it live. <laughs> All right. Uh, at this point, we've got over 25 episodes under our belt, growing se- selection of other video content, and seem to have figured out what we're doing as long as it's not the mics at the start of the podcast. We thought the time had come to open ourselves up for the possibility of advertisements, uh, both here on the show and the content that generates from this show, right? So you got this, but then this turns into the YouTube video and turns into the audio podcast, as well as on the blog. We're looking to do 30-second mid-show segments for the podcast and all of its forms. We're looking for sidebar ads for the website as well. So if you dig the show and are interested in having us promote your thing, just fire off an email to me, mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media, of course, works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, I prefer if questions come from the website, they're a little easier to track. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we're taking a break from our your questions to do a recap of the Bellhop's board gaming birthday bash. That's right. This past Saturday, I celebrated my birthday in the best way possible with good food, good games, and good friends. Luckily, the weather held out, at least for the trip down there, and Sean from Hamilton joined Sean and Hamilton and others for the <laughs> event. Yes, we had we had the, both Hamilton Seans. So to start off, we had we have a new tradition. I think it, it's become a tradition now. Anytime Sean comes down from from uh, Hamilton to Windsor, we go for ramen. Plus, come on, what better way to start a birthday party? We drove across town. We actually met Sean at a Kagero Ramen House. Tori and Kat, who uh, obviously you'll know from our Gloomhaven live stream, joined us as well. I personally went for my favorite, the Tan Tan Men, which is a peanut and spicy pork based ramen. Despite a general dislike of peanuts, I actually did the same. Uh, and it has a very different feel from what you often get from an Asian peanut dish in, uh, like a Thai. Uh, it's just so fantastic and literally steps away from where I grew up. Yeah, true. Like, you were even closer than me. We, Sean yeah. and I grew up in the same neighborhood, basically. I don't was was Eros there back then? Um, I think it did open up at some point, although I don't know if it was Eros. It was, there was, yeah. there was a well, restaurant there. Well, there was a there. restaurant there, yeah. yeah I don't, I don't know what it was at the time, though. So, after having some fantastic ramen, thank you, Solon, we headed back home. Uh, home as in my home, not Sean went back to Hamilton. We came back to my place. Uh, we had a bit of time to kill. I had some last minute cleaning to do before people came over later in the day. Uh, Plus, I still had to pack up the games to bring to the game store because we were going to be gaming at the store later. At one point, I grabbed Ticket to Ride New York off of a pile of shame and had planned to just read the instructions. 
But you know what? It seemed like we had time and Sean was there and the rules literally are like two pages. So we played a quick game. Now, Ticket to Ride New York is a lightning quick version of Ticket to Ride. Like there's only 15 spots on the map. Routes only run a max of four lengths. Uh, you start with two cards and 15 cabs and you get a choice of two of the destination tickets. When someone gets down to two or less cabs, the game ends. It's basically identical to Ticket to Ride, except for a small number of bonus points for connecting to tourist attractions on the board. I dig it. Uh, it gives you that Ticket to Ride feel in a very, very short time, like under 15 minutes. And that includes teaching. Uh, I'm not a huge Ticket to Ride fan. I think it's a fantastic gateway game. I think it's great for non-gamers, but for me, I find it usually doesn't hold my interest. I find my, my attention wandering partway through the game. With how short New York is, I found that I never actually lost that focus. Uh, even uh, on the faster digital game side, Ticket has never really been a go-to game for me, but the speed of this was a real bonus. Easy to pick up for pretty much anyone, even a complete rookie at gaming. But anyone with a bit of gaming XP will be off to the races. Uh, and yet still, there's just enough game there to, to make you think about it. Uh, one of the nice touches is the uh, instruction booklet is actually a, a mock-up of a tourist pamphlet that yeah. you get in the back of a cab. And that's just a nice little silly touch that, uh, you know, nice to see in a game like that. That is cool. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I would say better than I expected it to be. I received that one for Christmas. It's not one I would have went out and bought on my own, but I'm definitely not complaining to receive it as a gift. And because we've only just talked about that now, that one comes off the pile of shame too. We go yeah, down so one more and we're at 76. Nice. It's getting there. It's getting there. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get them all in by the end of the year, but I'm going to try. So after this, we played that game, we got a couple other things done, then we headed to the local game store, the friendly local game store. We were meeting a bunch of other gamers there because it happened to be the same night as their monthly gaming event, and I figure, why not just kind of combine the two events? So at 5 p.m., we headed to the CG Realm for more gaming. We met up with a bunch of local gamers. Um, some were there for the birthday, some were for the regular month event uh, i tried to really push getting people out because cg had agreed to do something awesome so for every board game night they have which is now twice a month the second and four saturdays of every month they're going to donate one dollar to our extra life efforts for 2019 now big thanks to jeremy for this generous offer now, for newer listeners who may or may not have gone through our back catalog, we at the Bellhop thoroughly support the Extra Life organization and last year raised more than $7,000 for the cause. Yeah, it was a fantastic. It was our best year ever. Like, that's crazy. Now, our target this year, Jeremy, Jeremy, who owns the store, has challenged us to hit 10000 this year. And part of that effort is starting this early in the year. We're not just going to start in September. We're already starting our raising efforts. So big props to uh, CG Realm and Jeremy for stepping up for that. Uh, what they're doing now is at every event, they hand around a pledge sheet to, um, sorry, not for every event, for every attendee at the event, they're going to donate a dollar. So they go around and say, hey, sign up and put your name down. I guess if people don't want to, they could refuse, but that seemed kind of odd if they did. I honestly don't know how many people were there. So I don't know how much we raised on Saturday. I probably should have got that number by the end of the night. So now we're there, we're at CG Realm. People have signed up for the Extra Life thing, awesome. And we sit down to play. So the first thing I broke out when we got there was Scoville. Uh, we set this up with the max player count of six. Now, this is 100% inspired by our last episode. We were just talking about Scoville last week. It was one of my recommendations for four to six player after dinner games that were hidden gems. And I had this in the heavy category. And now having played Scoville again, I think that was a mistake. So in Scoville, your players are pepper farmers. Each round, you go to the local auction and get some peppers. Then they each, in turn, plant one of the peppers they got. Then in reverse order, players move around the growing field and crossbreed peppers. Jumping back into regular player orders, players now use those peppers to fulfill market orders and enter the chili cook-off. I think it's a very neat theme, and man, is it a solid game. Like, that is just a tight, well-designed, good game. What I totally forgot was how easy to teach and play this game is. Like in my head, I remember it being heavy. Like I remember analysis paralysis and I swear there was math. They're really like, yeah, there's money, but like 
There's not really, I wouldn't claim there's, this is a mathy game. I also remembered it being long. Like we finished six player game in under two hours. And I, I really enjoyed it. I know Tori was sold, I think, by the second round. It's like, we got to get a copy of this game. And I think everyone else at the table really enjoyed it. I still think this is a fantastic game for six people. I just think it belongs down a level. It's in the medium weight category. I shouldn't have had that with the heavier fare. Yeah, definitely not what most would call a heavy game. I think it's rated uh, just under uh, the midpoint on uh, Board Game Geek. Uh, and though even, few, even though few of us had ever played the game... We still played it at quite a quick pace, and yeah. the point spread was not as wide as it easily could have been, with only one point separating the top three players at the end of the game. Yeah, it was impressive. I, I don't even remember who won. That's a bad sign. <laughs> Shows how much I pay attention. I, I don't know. There's it's something for Brian Kurtz, if he's still in his chat, that we're talking about competitive games and a topic that we'll bring up in the future. I'm just so, I don't know, I'm there to play games with my friends. I, I, I tried to win, but I, like, I couldn't even tell you who won. So while we played Scoville, a whole bunch of other people showed up. And that's why I always feel bad at these events, right? I'm like, hey, I'm here for your birthday. I'm like, sorry, I'm playing a game. But you can't get everyone playing all the things. So people split up, did their own thing. But when I finished scoville i owed someone i owed someone a game so kevin or tech who's often in our chat room of course the, the one night i'm talking about playing games with him he's not here but i think he works afternoon shift this week um he's a local gamer who's a fan of our show uh he often joins us in the lobby for our chat room whenever we're streaming he tends to stop in even when we're playing gloomhaven for a bit and say hi He's also managed to stop by a couple local events I've been at, but we just never managed to sit down and play a game together. So last time I saw Kevin at, at CG Realm, I'm like, dude, I owe you a game of Gizmos. You basically just watched me play a game, and then we chatted for a bit, and you had to go. So this was my chance to play a game with Kevin. Uh, we played four players. It was Sean, Kevin, and Kat, and myself, and it went really well. Like, I, I dig this game. I've talked about Gizmos enough, I think. I don't need to get into the details of how to play or how well it played. It was fun. It was good, and it was good to finally play a game with Kevin instead of just having him stand and watch us play. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I'd been hoping I would get this in while I was down, as I missed it at the New Year's event, uh, and I wasn't disappointed. It's fun, deceptively challenging, and it's got a depth that I think can be missed if you just give it a quick glance and dismiss it for being a silly marble gimmick game, uh, because yeah. it's really not. It's, it's so much more than that. I agree. Very, very solid game that, yeah, deceptive in its, um, not difficulty, because it's not hard either, but in its complexity. So after finishing up Gizmos, we took a look around and noticed everyone else in the store is busy playing something. Everyone's doing their own thing. So we stuck with the same group of four players, and I grabbed the Zool stained glass of Sintra. Now, the first thing I got to say is teaching this game the second time was miles ahead of that first time when I was fumbling through the rule book. Uh, I, I managed to get through the rules, I think, in under 10 minutes, and I think it actually made sense right from the start. Now, it did help that all the players knew Azul, so we didn't, I didn't have to teach it from scratch. I also found the game played much better than the first play there, the one that's on the live stream. Excuse me. Played better this time uh, than the one on the live stream. Having seen how scoring worked and being able to explain it while teaching really helped to be able to go, look, when you do this, this is what's going to happen, and this is why. And I think that also made it a much closer game. Uh, we actually had players watching other players board and hate drafting, which for Azul and that style of game is good to see, right? That's when you know the game, you're not just focused on your own thing, you're trying to make sure. And we had lots of people actually score the bonus tiles, as well as just completing windows, whereas that first play, almost no one managed to actually match the bonus tiles. Overall, I was very pleased to find the game got better on a second play. Like, it, I really enjoyed this one more than the first play of the game. Now, I'm still not putting it on the pedestal with Azul, but it's gone up a couple notches for me. Yeah, and I think we got it, got through it without any extreme variations as well. Uh, I know it helped for me that I had watched the playthrough yeah. uh, on the stream uh, and edited the content as well, so I watched it a couple yeah. of times. Uh, but yeah, no, it really, uh, it really just kind of fell in. And even though I hadn't played Azul in a while, uh, the familiarity, even though, again, it's not the same game, but oh. the familiarity with one does help with the other. Yeah, I, I, I like it. It's a solid game. I would still recommend, if you were going to go out and buy either one now, I would still stick with Basic as well. It's more accessible. If you prefer heavier games and you want a little more thinking, maybe buy the other. But if you're thinking you just want a game for your collection that's going to be accessible to the widest group of gamers possible, you're better off sticking to the original. But yeah, again, but maybe the more I play it, the more I may 
start shifting towards the other there, way, but I have a feeling it's not going to supplant. There was actually a thread directly about that in Reddit. It was uh, today, and it was uh, which wing should we go with? And they, you know, everyone pretty much agreed, and I even spoke up. I'm like, no, you know what? They were they were mentioning two player was their primary size as well. And for me, I, I can't imagine going with Sintra if you're going to be playing primarily two player. Azul is just a, a, a nicer game. It's a quicker setup. It's a smaller uh, play area. Uh, and, and the scoring means one person's just got a lot more work um, in the two-player Sintra. So I, I think Azul is definitely still the go-to. Yeah, I think I agree at this point. That's where I stand. So you go, uh, Brian, maybe at some point you might have to pick up the original as well. Or let me know when your birthday is. And maybe we can work something out. So when we finished up Azul, it was perfect timing because a couple other games were breaking up. So we mixed up the groups. This is where people got up, switched chairs. I think some people grabbed some food. Uh, friend and local gamer Scott came over to the table, and he offered to teach Railroad Inc. Uh, the Deep Blue Edition. Now, I've been hearing a lot of buzz about this roll and write on various podcasts. It's kind of all over the net right now. This seems to be one of the big games to come out so far this year, unless it might have been very late last year. But recently, come out recently, and I was really happy to get to try this. So in Railroad Inc., each player is given a city map board, and it's a dry erase thing with a 7x7 seven seven grid. And there's nine exit points on that grid that are all on the edges that are mixed between rail and road exits. Now, each turn, someone rolls the four dice, and then everyone has to use those same dice to fill in their grid with the symbols on the die. Now, the road, the dice have roads or rails in your usual straight T curve patterns. And then there's a couple junctions where it switches from railroad to road. And I think there's even like a bridge where one crosses over the other. Um... In addition, each player on their board has six special four-way intersections they can use, but they're only allowed to use three of the six through the whole game, and they can only use once per turn. Now, you play seven rounds, and then everyone's done their drawing, and you score each map. And you get points for how many of those exit you've connected, your longest road, your longest railroad, like road and rail, and for using the center nine squares of the board because they're harder to get to. You lose any points for any dead ends. I like this quite a bit. What I thought was really fascinating was that all the players are using the exact same information, the exact same dice. We all had the same things to build our cities every time, and everyone's map was completely different from everyone else's. I thought that was very neat. Now, there are red and blue versions of this game. Scott only owned the blue one, and I guess each one comes with some special dice. Like, there were four special blue dice. Now, we didn't try those, and I guess the red edition would have sp four red special dice. But just from what I played without those special dice, I liked it. Railroad Inc. was a solid filler game that's now on my wish list after that event. Like, I think I probably want to pick up both because then you can play a big eight-player game, and I think that would be pretty cool. Now, it probably helped that you kicked all of our butts, too. Uh, now, one thing I found notable about it just had nothing to do with the gameplay was actually the quality of the cards we were using. Uh, now, most people are familiar with how whiteboard surfaces generally have a little bit of memory on them and don't mm -hmm. th these things erased really easily and really thoroughly. Uh, so you didn't have to worry. I, I feel like the game would last a lot longer than I would have expected just looking at, oh, look, it's a white, it's a little whiteboard yeah. thing. I, I think it's got a lot more play in it than I would have expected just by looking at it on the shelf. Yeah, it seemed it seemed really good. Like the and the erasers too. Like they weren't the little I don't know, they weren't foam. They were yeah, yeah. well they're like they weren't bubbly foam. No, no, they were fabric they were fabric, not foam or felt. Yeah, and felt. they felt yeah, they seemed to work really well. Overall, yeah, I'm impressed. Like the dice were nice quality. The little box, like it's a nice little cute thing. Scott was really impressed by the fact that it had a little mag magnet clasp. Yeah. Nice touch. I'm I'm impressed. So we ended our time at the CG Realm with a classic. Uh, this one, again, inspired by our four to six player after dinner game discussion. Though this time I did not mess up the category it's in. It belonged exactly where I had it. And that is Bonanza, or as we like to call it, Bean. This is a 1990s card game from Uwe Rosenberg, now famous for Agricola, Caverna, and Fields of Arl, and a bunch of other farming games. Uh, this is as good now as it was when I first played it in the 1990s. Uh, each player is a bean farmer who starts with a hand of bean cards. 
two imaginary, I guess, fields in front of them. Uh, the trick to the game is you can't rearrange the cards in your hand. Each turn, you have to plant the first card in your hand, and then you can plant the second card. Then a market phase opens up where two cards are added to the market, and the active player can trade with everyone else at the table. Now, they probably want to trade away cards in their hand so that they're set up for next round. The other thing is they probably want to either keep or trade away those market cards, because if they don't trade them away, they're forced to plant it. Then everything everyone traded gets planted. And at any point, anyone can sell off a bean field and they get money for having sets of beans. The more beans of a type you have, and then there's rarities, there's beans, there's only eight in the deck, and there's beans, there's 22 in the deck, and there's a bit of an economy going on. Uh, this is a fantastic light trading and negotiating game that has a ridiculous amount of player interaction. Like, I had as much fun playing this Saturday as I have playing Beans many, many times over the years. Uh, I'm glad I still had this one in my collection. It was nice to get it back to the table again. Yeah, to call what we played there light is kind of an understatement. Uh, it was definitely a for fun game with yeah. more free trading and laughter than uh, most games of Beans have. Uh but you know what? It was a great group of players. Yeah. None of us was feeling especially competitive at the time. So we just had fun with it. And little bean cards were flying back and forth yes. across the table as fast as uh, as fast as you could play. People were hoarding beans for no other reason than the fact that they got a couple in their first hand and they were determined to yes. stick with that and not go with anything else. I, I am the coffee bean farmer. Yeah. I will not collect any other. I, I said, what's nice about it, too, is you could play either way. You can absolutely. sit down and play this game very seriously. Oh, absolutely. Like, I've actually used it in a great Canadian board game blitz tournament with four players. And it can be a very competitive game. Yep. But it goes both ways. And that's one of the things that makes the game so great. Yeah, if you pay attention and you you're you're paying attention to your you know the bean uh, the bean rarity and you know keeping an eye on what's happening everywhere and you're really focused, it is an intense game. I mean, there is some real play to it. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't need if you don't want to want to, it, then you don't have to. Yeah, definitely. And thankfully, the group wasn't mixed. That's the only time I think bean fails is when you get someone that really wants to take it seriously and some other people are just like, here, have my cards. Then it doesn't work so great. But that's just make sure you set expectations at the start of the game. So once that ended, um, we actually were running a little late because uh, Bonanza took a little longer than I thought it would. Although that end still really ramp up, ramps up quick. But uh, we then rushed and hurried and loaded up my van full of game and gamers, and headed back to my place for more gaming. Uh, once we got home, I broke out Bandu again. Now, having just played it on Wednesday, I was looking forward to giving it another go and playing it with gamers. So we played a six-player game. I think it went really well. There was a heck of a lot more of the bidding to decline. It was a much more cutthroat game. It was definitely about uh, giving bad pieces to your opponent more than it was excuse me, auctioning good pieces. But overall, now that I've played it a couple times, I'm starting to think I prefer Junk Art, which is a very similar uh, odd-shaped stacking game. It's it's similar in the fact that the pieces are not just cubes and squares. It's unique shapes. While Bandu has cooler pieces and higher production quality and nicer, chunkier wood and the wood's all stained, and I do like the auction mechanic, I just feel I get more out of Junk Art, because in Junk Art, every time you play, you shuffle a deck of rules, and you play three of them, and each of these are a different set of, like, a different way to play, like, a different way to play the game. So sometimes you're going to draft cards that determine what piece. The next time, maybe it's a race. It's whoever can build their tower the quickest and get it to one foot. Next time, you're picking your own pieces. Another one, there's even one where you get a hand of cards and there's like a, a trick-taking version on how you get your pieces. And there's even co-op where you're all building one structure. And it's different every time, especially because you're drawing three cards. Every time you play junk cards, it's probably going to be a completely different game, even just if it's the order you're going through. So while Bandu has four ways to play in the box, they're really not that varied. It's, yes, you must build taller, and then some weird rules for how the auction works. It's just not as varied as the options in Junk Art. Yep. Now, while that was going on, Ancient Games, myself, and a couple of others headed over to a second table and broke out Valeria Card Kingdoms. That's as, again, funny. I really have been on a card kick, uh, <laughs> and I was happy to continue it. Uh, now, this is a tableau builder rather than a deck builder where you have all your cards out to see, but a mm -hmm. dice roll at the beginning of each player's turn determines which of your cards activate 
uh, and give you uh, give you value to value to spend. Uh, we really enjoyed the sp the play, and I could see putting it out on my table. I think anytime. Uh, my only caveat is that the end game scoring wording on cards yeah. is badly done. Um, I, I would probably I, I haven't checked, but I, I would guess that B, uh, the BGG's got some uh, you know rewording or lengthy discussions on <laughs> that end game scoring because if as far as I was concerned, the exact reading of the end game court scoring card I had gave me thirty seven points. But uh, you would, you you've gone through this before apparently, mm -hmm. and the actual ruling gave me sixty seven points. Yeah, so that's a that's big a difference. Thirty point difference between what grammar tells me I should have and mm -hmm. what the game tells me. You know the the you know it, it's supposed to be. So there's there's some issues there. Yeah, for anyone who's seen the game, it makes it look like you're trying to collect sets of resources, but it's just total number of resources. And we made the same mistake. And it was by having the designer teach us at Origins that I learned that it was wrong, which is kind of weird. What I really like in that is I like the way the dice where you get both numbers and them added together. I yeah. thought that was fascinating. Just because, like, I, I'd, I'd love to see the bell curve. Like, I've never seen it, but, like, for seeing the numbers. Because that's, when you play the first time, you don't necessarily get it. But you start realizing that, like, anything that's seven or higher is actually really rare. Whereas one through six are extremely common because they could come up twice, right? So it really changes your values for the cards and what you want to collect. I found that one of the, the best things. Plus, it's, just, it's one of the best Tableau builders i played. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was, it was great fun. And, uh... You know, it was, it was actually amusing because somehow Tori and I had actually played almost the exact same strategy as we wow. hung through. <laughs> uh, but because we had very different end game scoring cards, the results, even though we were both playing that same strategy, were vastly different. Oh, neat. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like the replayability too. Like the the fact that what's up is going to change every game. Yeah, nice. absolutely. We had just randomly picked out the, uh, the citizens for the game so uh, we could play a completely different game uh, without any of the same cards being mm -hmm. up in, in the next time. Yeah, that's awesome. So next, it wasn't really intentional, but just the way the game groups got split up, I ended up playing a few four-player games in a row with the same group. Not that that was a problem, just the way it worked out. Uh, up up first was yet another game inspired by our four to six player after dinner blog game post because, you know, it's after dinner and we had four to six players. So it kind of makes sense. Plus, I just talked about how excited I was about these hidden gem games. So I wanted to get a few to the table. So this is when I grabbed Euphoria Build a Better Dystopia. Uh, it's been quite some time since I played this, and I got to admit it showed. I probably shouldn't have just grabbed this blind off the shelf. I should have done a re-review of the rules before playing. I didn't do the best, my best job teaching the game, and I do have to give thanks to Stonemeyer Games for including a great summary sheet because uh, Sean Hamilton was playing with us and happened to reference it a couple times and caught a few of my mistakes early. Despite a few bumps in the road, like I even offered to restart the game because we weren't that far in when we found it. We're like, nah, let's just play. We're all playing for fun anyway. The game went really well once we got the rules down. Uh, everyone seemed to enjoy it. Uh, the big thing we found, though, was because of that gap, kind of forgot how things played out. And man, we kind of wanted to play again. Like it's it's one of those games where one play, you get it. You're like, oh, now I get it. Now I want to play for real. Uh, like, you need to see things, like how important the four different factions they are and how bad it can be to not take part in building buildings in the game. Um, has it been so long? This was almost like playing a learning game, even though I played it before. The thing is, we're at a birthday party and we're surrounded by lots of games and we decided to move on to something else. But man, I kind of want to get the same group together next Saturday just to play again while we're still, the game's fresh in our mind. Yeah. Well, now at this point... Someone else at uh, the other table. So we actually had three different gaming groups going yeah. on. Uh, and they had finished up with Azul. So having finished up Valeria, we snagged Azul and put it out on our table. Uh, and now we'd all played before. So it was a quick and easy play for a couple of games in a row. We actually, uh, we did play it twice. Uh, and it was very relaxed, very social, though still quite cutthroat. Um, <laughs> as uh, Enough to evoke some language that uh, can't be repeated until the after show. So... Uh. Did, did Tori kick everyone's butts? I know he keeps bragging that he's the Azul master now. He'd like to think so. He <laughs> We'll just leave it at that. 
so back over on the main table, I think the other group brought out Terraforming Mars, if I remember. I think Terraforming Mars got played three times. I just never played it. It's it's not just me who loves that game. Uh, so the next game I brought out is literally one of my favorite games of all time. I'm certain it was on my top 20 games of right now. And a really silly reason why it made me think of this game is because when I took a Giza, or when I took Euphoria off the shelf, it was sitting right on top of a Giza. Uh, Agizia is a fantastic game. It, I really still love this game. It's an Egyptian-themed game where players are competing to build monuments for the pharaoh. It's a worker placement game where the neat thing is that your workers are boats and the worker placement spots are along the Nile and it kind of zigzags down the board. But after you place your first boat, every subsequent boat has to go further down the river, further down the Nile. And you can't go back. So if you jump ahead to a spot, you're giving up your chance to take any of the previous. Now, this isn't like Takedo, where the last player goes first. It's not a big rondel. This is more like a game called Francis Drake, where it's just you can jump ahead, but you're giving up on your chance to, to take advantage of those spots. Now, you're using those worker placement spots to increase your fo food and stone production, train your work crews, upgrade your farms and quarries, uh, also affect the weather, and then pick up a bunch of bonus cards that bake, break the rules in some way. Now, points are scored at the end of the game by building Sphinx cards, or building the Sphinx and getting Sphinx cards, and then those let you get hidden goals, as well as getting the other monuments you score in-game points. Uh, it, it's fantastic. It's way more than I can cover in a short amount of time. You kind of have to see it and play it to see it, but it is still one of my favorite games, even if I played absolutely terribly on Saturday, coming in last place by almost 50 points. Well, on our table, after Azul was done, we put out Splendor, despite <laughs> Moe's complaints that we should just play Gizmos as bed, uh, instead because it's a better game. Now, I had never actually played Splendor and made some rookie mistakes in our first game, but we just kept playing it over again as it was getting late and we were all a bit loopy. And with various <laughs> distractions, we were barely even keeping track of whose turn it was. Uh, but just having a nice, fun social game of it, basically. Uh, for those of you who don't know, because we don't, I don't think we've really talked about it much, possibly because you prefer Gizmos, uh, Splendor is a card drafting set collection game. Uh, nothing too difficult, but quite enjoyable. Uh, especially when you may not be mentally or physically up for gizmos. Uh, I think yeah, some, some people might have had difficulty actually grabbing dice or uh, um, marbles Poker chips. at that point. No marbles. Oh, marbles. At that point, marbles. It's small and um, small. And you don't want you don't want them shooting off as you're uh, you know wildly <clears throat> ricocheting around. Um, but no, I you know what I enjoyed it. Uh, and I interestingly I, I was interested because a lot of people had compared the uh, semi bad. Minecraft game to Splendor. Mm -hmm. um, and while I, I can see the similarities now, I understand the, the comparison. Splendor is still a far superior game to that Minecraft card game. But uh, I, I understand where they were coming from now, at least. You're just lucky Extra Life hadn't hit yet, because I probably wouldn't have had Splendor anymore, because I have a feeling that one's going in the call pile this year. I have to say, I, though, I love game. the coins. The, the, metal, yes. the metal coins on it are, you know, metal center coins are fantastic. Though if you buy it now, it doesn't come with those. They're plastic now. So they have reduced the production quality on that game. Not sure why. So after Gizia, I was feeling a little burnt out. Uh, it's It can be a brain burner, and I did terrible. So I wanted something lighter. So this led me to grab a game I don't think we've ever talked about, and that is Gravwell Escape from the Ninth Dimension. This is a very neat card-driven sci-fi game that uses gravity as its main theme and mechanic. So each player has a spaceship that's stuck in a gravity well, and it looks kind of like a big black hole thing. And each turn, you're going to play cards to move your ship and try to escape the, the black hole, the gravity well. The thing is that the gravity of the other ships stuck in the well affect your movement. So you have 26 different movement cards, all based on the value of the alphabet. So yeah, and it, they're just supposed to represent rare elements or something. Most of these have you move towards the nearest source of gravity. That's your generic move. Is you play a six, you move wherever the nearest source of gravity is, you move six spaces. Uh, if that happens to be behind you, you're going back deeper into the grav well. If it's in front of you, you're hopefully getting out. Other cards, less of them, I couldn't tell you the exact numbers, have you push away from the nearest source of gravity. And then a few cards, like three or four out of the entire deck, actually pull everything towards you. 
the whole game is about timing because everyone plays their cards. You draft cards and you see half of the cards everyone player drafted. So if you're paying attention, you'll re try to remember that, you know, Mike has the A, for example, and maybe going forward. I wasn't capable of that kind of memory at this point. But uh, you're, you're trying to time it. So the earlier the card is in the alphabet, the quicker it goes. So if everyone puts down their cards and you played a nice early card, you're going to go before everyone else. And it's trying to time when your movement goes based on where everyone else's ships are. So you're trying to predict where their ships are going to be and try to get it so that the gravity is in the right place. It is very fun. Like it's a, It's a neat game. It's a unique theme. I don't think... Anything else in my collection is quite like this game, and it's lighter than you would expect. Like with that heavy, oh, it's gravity. You got no, it's not that hard. You just look. The closest ship is the closest thing in gravity. If there's things equidistant, you count how many things are on each side. It's and then it's go forward or not, and everyone gets an emergency stop card they can use once a turn because holy cow, you're it's at some point you're gonna mess it up. Yeah, and all that while we were still playing Splendor. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed Arzade has joined us in the chat and noted as well that I don't think any of us were capable of that kind of memory at 3 a.m. So, yeah, at this point, it gotten late. I don't know if I've, it's been implied, but obviously there was some people taking part in alcohol as well, and that was affecting our ability, at least my ability, to play games. So at this point, it was getting pretty damn late. As Arzade just said, it was around 3, maybe 4 a.m. There weren't many of us left at this point. Um, four of us sat down to another game of Gizmos. I probably had to convince Sean he had to play Gizmos after Splendor, but I don't quite remember. Um, at this point, the craft beers had gone down, and I got to admit, I don't remember too much about this play of Gizmos, except for the fact that Cat beat Charles. Because we've mentioned Charles a couple times on this show, and Charles is a local gamer who's known to be really good at strategy games. And it's kind of a local challenge to, or it, for leading to bragging rights if you can beat Charles at a game. Charles finds this hilarious, right? So I have now, I do have to admit, the only reason I know Cat beat Charles or Ty beat Charles is Sean told me the next morning. And here's where things were dwindling down to the end uh, people saying their good nights or good mornings. Uh, yeah. And but we still had to squeeze in one more game before it was over and uh, and everyone said their final goodbyes. Yeah, here we come full circle. We're going to end the night right back with it started with ramen. No, that's how we should have ended the night. No, we're going to go right back where it started game-wise and go back to Ticket to Ride New York. I got to admit, I barely remember playing this game, but I'm told I was rather proud of tying Charles for the win. Absolutely. Uh, and with that, uh, it was 6 a.m., and uh, the last, the last people departed, and uh, I took my place on the couch, and uh, that was the end of the board game birthday. Yes, it was. That was a lot of games. I think I counted. I got in nine different games, and I think like twelve plays of all those different games. It was pretty damn good. Had a had a great time. I anyone who was there who is listening to this, I do thank you for coming out. Look forward to doing it again next year. Well, some of it again next year. I'll take it a little easier on the no no breaking out the uh, Quebec whiskey partway through the night. <laughs> All right. And uh, so Anchi Games has declared that you will not be getting rid of Splendor. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's fine. So, uh, I, I, I thought she was of the same opinion I was on that one. Nope. Nope. <laughs> uh, and uh, where else were? Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess she had played with uh, the Joker tiles when you guys were when they broke it out at uh, CG Realm, but oh, okay. uh, we didn't we didn't do the Joker tiles when we were playing our games at the time. So I still haven't I still haven't played the Joker tile uh, version. There's something you can try next time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and she was she was mentioning that uh, the Duke that Tori had was massively unbalanced, and that was the one. It was the one that like it was like two times the value of every card in his hands. Um, wow. Yeah. That seems nuts. Yeah. So I wonder, I wonder if that was the promo. Cause we have one promo Duke um, or if, or if it's one that's from the base game that's unbalanced. That could be, I gotta admit there, there's a love hate relationship with that game. I love it. Uh, but like on the internet, there are people who definitely feel one of the things people really do not like is how much resources you collect. And every time I teach the game, I've got to point it out that there's a reason there's times 10 tokens. Right. You are going to collect 30, 40 power and possibly use it all in one turn to kill five monsters. And that's by design. That's yeah. right from the designer that that's kind of thing they wanted to happen. But people who are used to playing 
say ascension are like what the heck like right. I, why i just get I, it's like every turn i get all these resources and i got all this stuff and i don't know what to do with it and i have heard complaints about various dukes being broken so right yeah I, the, the duke store problem i didn't find the the resource gaining a problem but the dukes well that one duke in particular and the in the the phrasing of the dukes in general was uh, problematic sounds good Now, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other questions when we answer them, answered in blog form. Yeah, in this case, I actually click on On the Table, because I put this under On the Table, because this wasn't really Gaming Advice. i got to remember to edit that part of the show <laughs> notes. I messed that up. I, I edit stuff earlier, but I forget this section. All right, let me do a quick take two, then. Yeah. This was a great talk. But if you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on On the Table, where you'll see this particular discussion answered in blog form. Send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We need more questions. They're actually starting to run low, like literally this time. They're, they're, they're getting there. I did get a couple from some people in the last couple of days. Thank you for that. But we could use more. It can be any type of game-related question. Hey, I like this game, this game, and that game. Give me some recommendations. Or, hey, I'm planning an event doing this. Do you have games that go good for that? Or go more deep and philosophical and ask us about how to handle problem players. Uh Tell us a story. You know, you write in like a Dear Abby. Hey, the other day I was at the game store and this happened. What would you do? We're more than welcome to do that kind of topic as well. Now, speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk about games and game mastering. Note the time did change on that. They are now broadcasting earlier. Brian Kurtz, thank you, and thanks for joining us in the chat tonight. Duran Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, still digging Sintra, even better on the second play. Steve D, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks for coming out Saturday. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Mom. And Danielle Thomas, thanks very much. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued effort, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch for Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.